Good afternoon. Welcome to our presentation today. The task group presents question documents more than just handwriting. This presentation will be audio broadcast to your computer speakers, so please make sure that your speakers are turned on and the volume is set to a reasonable level. Today our presentation will discuss techniques that are routinely used in the law enforcement forensic sciences laboratories and are directly applicable to civil casework as well as for defense work in criminal cases. Topics such as the analysis of original versus non-original writing ink, paper, optical brightener, color toner printer dot matrix patterns, paper hole analysis, and the alteration of documents with type font substitution will be discussed. Please note that the handwriting aspects of the question document presentation will be offered as a separate presentation due to the in-depth and lengthy information that will be provided today. Our presenter today is Mr. Jeffrey Luber. Jeffrey Luber is a forensic document examiner certified by the American Board of Forensic Docu Document Examiners. He has over 33 years of experience in a civilian governmental crime laboratory. Mr. Luber holds a master's degree in forensic science from the George Washington University and a Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of Maryland. He is also a member of the American Society of Question Document Examiners. His typical casework involves handwriting identification, medical records examination, forgery, and print process determination, as well as ink differentiation. Mr. Luber has been qualified to testify as an expert witness in the United States Federal Court, Illinois State Court, and New York Supreme Court. Please note at the end of the presentation, there will be a survey that comes up. Uh, if you are looking for CLE credit, this presentation is uh, eligible for various dates, which we will discuss at the end of the presentation. So please make sure that you take a few moments to complete that survey. Uh, now I will turn the presentation over to Mr. Luber, and we'll begin. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Slide here. So we're going to be talking about question documents, and unfortunately, I had to redact uh, a lot of information on the, the casework, and hopefully, it won't be too, uh, you know, uh, distracting uh, as we go over the slides. So uh, here's a, a uh, Jeff. Sorry to interrupt you. We just have a couple people who can't hear you too well. If you could speak up a little bit, that would be great. Okay. So. Okay. Um, um, Here's a, uh, a case scenario where a lawsuit, uh, you know, comes into play where the opposing side has a contract uh, created, uh, they think, recently and not as the date indicates in 2008. So um, all sides will not allow any ink testing, uh, even though it's only very slightly destructive. They won't allow it. So what else can be done, you know, when you have a, a kind of a scenario like this? And one thing that's, that uh, has been very quiet but came about in uh, the middle 1990s was uh, something called a, a CPS code for color toner printers and color, color toner copiers. And that's for counterfeit protection, and CPS stands for counterfeit protection code. So if you do have a contract or something printed in color on a toner as opposed to inkjet, uh, we may be able to do something in terms of the analysis. Um, you know, here's a contract. The date of the contract is February 3rd, 2008. You can see that at the bottom area here. And so now the question is, was it really signed in, at that time period? And <clears throat> because color toner is being used, if we actually look at the document using uh, certain filtration properties, color uh, filtration properties, you'll notice a um, kind of a dot matrix pattern that's in the background, that's actually in the yellow toner. 
and that will give you the serial number of the printer. And uh, along with that, for most printers, it will give you the date of uh, that it was actually printed. So it's, it's always the serial number of the printer, and also um, for about 90% of the, the toner printers, it's going to give you the date of the actual printing of that document. So, um, you know, if the document is printed in, you know, 2011, that's a pretty good clue that the item was backdated. So it's a, one of the subtle features. It's in currency. Uh, it's not in currency, but it's used for currency counterfeit protection because a lot of the better quality counterfeits are done on a color toner copier, and uh, this way it links. Uh, it, you're, one's able to link that uh, counterfeit document back to the um, the copier that produced it. But it's not only you know for just contracts. So you could have something. Uh, here's another image done in a, a reverse color to kind of give you a better idea of the um, uh, of that dot matrix pattern. It's not an alphanumeric character, so it's not very apparent to the eye, and it's in the yellow toner. So the yellow toner on a white background is very, very hard to see normally. So, but it's not only applicable to, let's say, a counterfeit uh, currency. Uh, in our laboratory, we get a counterfeit ketamine bottles, we get other kind of uh, pharmaceutical type bottles. Just visually looking at it, this was a DEA case, and visually looking at that bottle, you know, I could tell the, the label was probably printed with a toner process. And if we go a little further, um, here it is enhanced a bit, and you can see the actual dot matrix pattern uh, present. And you have to look at the whole pattern, so you may have to look at, you know, over a wide area. But you'll get the serial number and date of production. And then with that, uh, you know, for the investigator, that serial number, uh, and it's also the brand. You, you get the brand and serial number, the make and serial number. And with that information, the investigators can go back to the companies, find out who that serial number was sold to, and, and kind of track it down. So it, it's not only uh, applicable to... Um, uh, you know, regular document type cases, what you would traditionally think of as a document type case, but also, you know, narcotics and things like that. In this particular case, when we told DEA that we uh, had this type of information, the only thing they wanted to know was whether it was ketamine or not. You know, they could care less about the other information, which was kind of sad, but I don't know. That's their end. So uh, here's another example. This is a steroid. These were illegal steroids that were actually did contain steroid uh, material. This is injectable steroids, and it's the same kind of deal with uh, the dot matrix pattern being present. And it was pretty much the same kind of deal where they really didn't care about it. They only cared that there was steroid present, and uh, they could you know, arrest the people or do the conviction for possession of the material. So one other, that's something to consider, you know, another possibility, you may have a paid substitution in a contract or a document. This is simply a four-page uh, document that was put together. We kind of created this for the uh, presentation. And if we look at the staple holes, they, uh, these are kind of a high contrast shot. Maybe it's not the best, but you'll see, you know, staple holes present. And uh, next slide. We'll see an extra set of staple holes. So uh, that could be a problem, you know, unless there's a good, and there may be a good explanation for it, but if there's not, then that could certainly be a problem why Three of the uh, four sheets of paper have one full set of staple holes with a staple present and one doesn't. So something may have been, you know, misaligned. And just by looking at the staple holes without even taking the staple out, we should be able to uh, discern if there are multiple uh, staple holes present. Uh, one other thing to look at is optical brighteners. So in this particular scenario that I created, three of the pages are reacting in, in um, you know, one type of response, page one, two, and four, you know, kind of equal brightness uh, with the optical brighteners that are incorporated in the paper. 
And page three, which happened to have the two staple holes in it, is a much duller response. So it, it's a comparative type analysis. In other words, one item is compared to the other. I'm not actually measuring the response, but visually you can see one is certainly different. And optical brighteners are put into papers to make them more um, bright or whiter in um, generally fluorescent type lighting or office lighting scenarios. And what they do is they uh, convert um, uh, UV light uh, into uh, uh, white light, into a, a green wavelength actually. So it's a whiter into the visible spectrum. So in this particular um, examination, the papers were illuminated in the UV, long loop uh, UV, which is 365 nanometers. That's the wavelength. 303 nanometers is a good wavelength also to do the illumination. And um, you can see there's a visibly they, they look very similar in, in normal lighting conditions, but in the ultraviolet light condition, um, there's, a, there's a much bigger difference. That's another aspect you may not think about if you do think there's a page substitution, but uh, along with the staple hole analysis. And you may have four or five or six sets of staple holes in, in a, uh, maybe a three or four page contract. So each has to be tracked back and examined. And, and you know, it's, it's kind of a long, tedious exam, but it certainly can be done, and, and it is done, you know, especially in white collar cases. It's done a lot. Okay, so... Just to go on again with the, the stapling aspect of it, um, sometimes, well, let, let's just go into uh, how staplers are actually um, uh, created in the paper. So uh, on the left-hand side of this diagram, the staple is applied, and on the bottom area, the blue is kind of an anvil that accepts those two legs of the staple and pushes and bends them uh, towards the horizontal bar, and so it's pretty straightforward. But what's interesting is that in uh, photocopy stapler systems, it's a little bit different. They have a different appearance to them. And the anvil, here the anvil is in the up position. That's how it is on, on our particular stapler at, at the lamp. The anvil is in the up position, and it's not quite as a defined curvature. Uh, for the anvil, so subsequently the legs don't get curved in as much. Um, now, depending on the brand, our stapler uses fixed length staples, others come off a reel of wire, so uh, that may be uh, helpful in trying to determine what type of machine or whether the machine could have actually produced that stapled group of documents. Sometimes that's the question. You know, we have these staple documents. They say it was produced on brand X uh, photocopy machine that has a stapling capability. Could that have happened? And sometimes you can exclude that possibility based whether it's on a fixed length or it's on a wire that changes length. So here's an example of a staple, the, the back end of a, a staple document, and that's done on a hand stapler. It's uh, very defined uh, curvature. And this is what happens in a photocopy machine where it's, this is a, actually a fixed length stapler. You'll see, uh, I can't quite get the arrows to change direction here, but you'll see there's a very, very slight curvature to that staple leg. Very slight. But the difference between the two is very apparent. Now, this is looking at the, um, the top end. You'll see a difference in the actual length. And different photocopy machines have different length of uh, staple uh, base area. And that would be, this would be considered the base area here. You know, the length from here to here. And if we look on the back side, we'll see, you know, it's a dramatic difference. So. Sometimes it doesn't matter at all, big deal. But other times when you find out the scenario of the case, you know, well, who actually stapled that? Oh, I got that from the uh, the copy machine. You know, well, did you really, or was that hand stapled? You know, and now you could say, 
you know, maybe what's the real answer here? And maybe they just forgot or, you know, maybe, uh, you know, if you're trying to track different sets of documents, this is more for the uh, investigators or intelligence intelligence kind of agencies where they're trying to track certain documents, things like that. So it's just something to consider, and uh, you may want to let your investigator know. Uh, they may be aware of it or they may not be. Generally, dealing with the DA's office, I can tell you they're probably not aware of it. So, you know, it's just one more avenue to look at. So I see now there's a, a, a break for questions. Yeah, we have a couple questions. Um, our first one is regarding the beginning of the presentation. Um, does the same protocol apply for older copy machines with the dot matrix that apply to some of the more modern ones? Well, the CPS code came out in about 1993. <clears throat> so uh, color copiers came out, you know, toner copiers now, not inkjet printers, but toner printers or toner copiers really maybe started uh, very late 1980s or early 1990s. Um, if you get an earlier type copy machine, you're going to you're gonna notice a difference. They, they don't have the, the resolution or the fineness of uh, product as the newer ones, but you should kind of assume that anything done in the late 1990s is going to have this uh, technology uh, incorporated within it. And, and I doubt you would actually find an old toner copy or a toner printer prior to 2000 or so. That would be 14 years old and it would probably be broken. <laughs> I, I don't know. But, but well, we I, hope. Just, I, I, would, I mean, honestly, I would just assume that it would be a newer version, but technically you would think, by law, all toner copiers or toner printers had to have this uh, kind of firmware technology incorporated within it. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question regarding the stapling. Um, somebody asked, do you have an example of a case where the mechanics of a stapler came into play? Uh, only in, it, it, uh, only in the, um, the aspect of, you know, where it was supposedly created. You know, um, the people were saying, you know, I, we got this directly, um, from the attorney who produced it on their photocopy uh, machine. And uh, it turns out that it was from a photocopy staple uh, type system. So that correlated their story as opposed to, uh, it actually helped them out because the other side was saying, you know, no, you created that and uh, from another copy of the document. So uh, one thing I failed to mention is that staple holes uh, usually are very apparent on photocopy documents. So something to keep in mind. You know, you, you look for those staple holes on there. You can see that it was previously stapled and the staple removed. So uh, something that's usually overlooked, actually. Okay, that's all the questions we have for the moment uh, until our next break. Okay, so let's go on. We'll talk about watermarks. Uh, Probably most people are familiar with watermarks. They know that general, generally watermarks are found in the, the higher cotton content of documents. That's not always the case, but it's an expensive process. You tend to not find it in, let's say, regular photocopy type paper. And uh, it has to do with the materials in the paper, the softwood versus hardwood content, as well as uh, any cotton in there. But here's a photograph of a uh, watermark. It looks pretty good, and yet, um, you know, normally you see a, a, a watermark. It's covered over with printing, with typing, you know, with the letterhead of the company or with a signature. And this actually looks pretty darn good. So you know it's created for this kind of a talk. Um, and you can read everything on there. It's pretty apparent. And then you kind of get to something like this where you see a vertical mark. <coughs> and you're wondering, you know, what, what's that, the number one or, you know, why is that there? And it's actually a dating code. So uh, that indicates uh, when that dandy roll was changed 
and when that designer, that dandy roll was used in the paper production. Uh, in this particular case, that dating code is 2004. So, and there's a certain, you know, actual date associated with that. So, um, the um, paper could not have, uh, you know, was that dandy roll was used. After that particular date, the introduction date in uh, 2004. Now, uh, so if you have a contract that's dated, you know, 2001 with that watermark on there, you know, you have big problems because that paper wasn't in existence at that time period. And, of course, all this has to be referenced and uh, researched with the paper company. And, but they have records of all the... Uh, you know, they run samples, and they have all these records. This is nothing new for them. <clears throat> so uh, dating codes are very subtle within the watermark, and, you know, researching a watermark is certainly something that's part of the job, and uh, you, you can get some interesting results with that. Let's go to the next one is uh, Gilbert Bond. It used to be a very popular uh, kind of paper. And this is where the water, uh, dating code is located. <coughs> These are all three different dating codes. One's longer than the other, um, between the top one and the second one down. The top one's a little longer, the second one's a little shorter, but in that same location. And then the third one has a dating code under the letter D in bond, and, um, a, you know, a completely different location. So sometimes the dandy rolls, and of course the dandy rolls are at the very end of the wet production of the paper process, and, you know, they wear out also. So sometimes um, you may have, let's say, the second one, well, let's say the first one and the second one may be around the same day. One wore out and had to be repaired, you know, it certainly, and but it's noted that it's a repair by a different mark on there. So, uh, again, you'll have that date of when that repair was done, and that will help, uh, you know, establish a dating of when the paper was actually produced. So if you're told that, that they were, you know, if I were to tell you the dating code, it says January 1st, you know, 2004, and you found out the document was dated, uh, you know, December 27th, 2003, well, you know what, who knows when the real date was. You know, it could go either way, I would say. You know, you research it and, you know, on your end, and you can get somebody to swear it had to be after January 1st, then okay. But, you know, there's always a little bit of slop time in there. You know, when it was actually changed versus the, when it was actually recorded, I'd give it a little bit. But if it's 2004 and you have a document dated 2002, you know that's backdated. Because the paper wasn't around then. Of what we had talked about. So here's a case that uh, I got, and I actually had the original of the case. So what can be done with the will? And this kind of goes back to watermarks in, in, in kind of a kind of a strange way, I guess. <clears throat> so um, this was a pre-printed will, kind of like a Blumberg form, and I, I don't recall the name of it. It was a uh, Indian name from Florida, from the Florida area. That's the name of the uh, company that produced these types of forms. So the attorney contacts me. I have the original, and they want me to look at the uh, typing. Was the type font in existence at the time? Was the uh, coloration from the ribbon or toner? I don't recall right now if it was um, carbon film ribbon or actual um, inked ribbon on the paper. Was that in existence at the time? So a lot of questions, and the will was dated January, uh, some date in January 1972. So, uh, you know, researching font and researching, you know, uh, chemical composition of carbon film toner is very expensive, very, uh, I mean, hours and hours, you know, you could talk 50, 100 hours, easy. And you still may not come up with anything definitive. So, um, uh, you know, uh, typewriter uh, fonts at 
that time, this was a typewriter, you know, it became generic after a while. You know, uh, it used to always be IBM, but that's a different story. But you could have a very hard time really coming up with it, something definitive. But what you had to do was go to the bottom of the page, and right over here is actually a dating code of when the paper uh, was printed. And with this company, in researching with the company, they said, we produced this in August of 1984. So the will's dated 1972. Um, you know, it was pretty much of a, you know, a win-win, like a no-brainer, you know, kind of like a grounder. It was pretty good. So you could have spent hundreds of hours or, you know, at least 100 hours on it. And here within about, you know, four hours or five hours, you had the whole thing done. So that was pretty good. All right, next we're going to talk about um, infrared examinations of ink, and that's really differentiating inks based not on uh, looking at it visibly in the visible spectrum, but more in the infrared spectrum, and it's the near-infrared spectrum. So visible light is this very small area in here, and it goes from about 400 nanometers of light to the infrared starts about 700, and we extend it out to about 1,100 nanometers that I can uh, actually uh, do the analysis on. So this is a um, kind of a typical unit. This is a unit from Foster and Freeman. It's a video spectral comparator. And uh, what it does is it allows me to examine in real time um, inks in the infrared region, and it's simply a camera system with a chip, a camera sensor. We used to use film years ago, but now this is a camera sensor that's sensitive in the infrared region, and by using various filters, I'm able to block visible light and only pass infrared to the, uh, the camera system. So it works great. And it's non-destructive. So, you know, Everybody's screaming about, you know, cutting out plugs of ink, and, you know, rightly so, sometimes anyway. Um, it's strictly non-destructive. So here's a uh, check, uh, viewing it in the visible spectrum, normal lighting, which is 400 to 700 nanometers, 400 to the blue, 700 up to the red. Um, it, lo it looks pretty consistent. And then if we look in the infrared spectrum, which is 715 nanometers, so what I'm doing is I'm blocking visible and only passing 715 nanometers to the um, camera chip. And you see there's, there's quite a difference there. So those inks, while uh, visible and all look consistent in, in the visible region, in infrared, they drop out. If they were the same ink, they should react the same. The only reason they wouldn't react the same would be if there's a defect to the paper or staining or contamination on that paper. And that's something you, you always, as an examiner, you always look for. There was none, so there's no reason those inks should uh, react differently. And that's in reflected... Um, infrared, and there's also something called infrared luminescence, where the ink uh, is illuminated, uh, excited at about 500 nanometers, which is in the blue area, or blue-green, and we block visible light to the um, uh, detector, and, uh, well, in this case, it's 665 nanometers, so it's right at the end of the visible light to the uh, detector. Sometimes we block all the way up to, let's say, 800 or 900 nanometers. But whatever, forget about that. You see there's a difference here between that uh, whiteness of the word gale and uh, that whiteness of the slash line and the Jeff, kind of highlighting that with pointers. You see some of the inks still absorbing the infrared, they appear black. And so if you just look at the Gale slash Jeff on this top line, it's not all reacting the same. So in this check there actually, um, you see the differences there. Uh, I'm missing one slide, but the last slide to that says that I had at least, oh it does say that at the top, 
at least three different inks were used. So, um, you know, it's very good at differentiating, and luminescence is very good at even further differentiating. So if you only had black and white reflective, you know, you may say, well, I have two different inks. Well, you may, you know, what you would have to say is at least two different inks, at black and white reflective, and then with the luminescence, you're going to say at least three different inks. And there could be more inks that further analysis may differentiate, but at this point I can't differentiate anymore. Hopefully that makes sense. So here's a uh, prescription. Um, this is the uh, quantity amount, 90, and it was actually altered because the o zero was added. And uh, so it was originally written for 9. If we did further examination, you'd see that it was really, everything uh, appears in this black, I think, except for the 0. But in infrared examination, we see that the 0 is a different formulation, different physical uh, constituents than the rest of the other ink. It's reacting different. And that was at 715 nanometers. Any questions? Uh, we have a question, yes, from Douglas. He asks, would you expect every complete page of every ream of paper to have a dating code? Well, the dating code, if I understand the question, the dating code is applied by the photocopy machine. So either the uh, photocopy uh, color toner photocopy machine or color toner printer. So that will have, <clears throat> I know some of the HP ones actually have the time stamp on there. So if it's an HP, you'll actually get a different time. It's hour and minute, I want to say. Um, I don't know if they have seconds, so at least at some point you'll get a different hour and minute. But you'll have the serial number, make, model, and serial number, and sometimes, well, and sometimes a date, and sometimes with that date, a, a time stamp as well. So not every machine puts that time stamp on there. So keep in mind that that photocopy machine or, or printer, color toner only, uh, and only if it's, uh, generally only if there's color involved, we'll put that uh, date stamp on. I hope that answers that. Uh, we have another question in regards to the first question. Do non-color printers and copiers have date stamps? No. No. None that are, you know, um, uh, kind of transparent there, uh, you know, is a latent image. None that have a latent image. So, and actually, they could have inkjet printers do this also, but the companies refuse to go along with it. That information about the CPS code was supposed to be a secret. It was supposed to be not for general knowledge and uh, not to be revealed to the public. And eventually, it got out. There was a uh, kind of a group out there that, uh, you know, talks about Big Brother and things like that, and they kind of exposed it. It was not supposed to be general knowledge. And then once it was, the the manufacturers of these uh, uh, printers and copiers got really pissed off because now they were afraid people would not buy their brand knowing that this is imported, but all brands across the board have it. Okay, and Douglas had a follow-up question. Um, he said, I saw that the dating code was from the manufacturer of the paper. Is this not true? Oh, yeah. No, no. That, not that I know of, anyway. The manufacturing code in the paper itself? No. Nope. Okay, and we have one final question. Um, how do you actually handle digital watermarks? I really don't get involved with digital watermarks that much. We have IT people that get involved with that. So uh, that's kind of handed over to them. I don't get involved with it at all. 
Okay. Um, that seems to wrap up our questions for this portion, so we'll continue with the presentation. Okay. So let me just say that generally there are two types of watermarks in paper, and one is a physical watermark where there's actually a thinness in the paper, and that's what I was showing earlier where you, there's a transparency, but due to uh, – actual lack of or uh, different density of paper fibers in that particular area. And at the physical watermark, the, the dandy roll actually pushes away the fibers. There's another type of watermark called chemical watermark where uh, a chemical like a wax is, is, makes the paper translucent in that area, but it's the same density of paper fibers in that area. So that's one way to tell, like, when you get involved with the high-end stuff and maybe some of the clandestine um, intergovernmental, uh, you know, the big government agency stuff where you have created watermarks. And generally, they're created by that uh, translucency of the paper, not the thinness of the paper. And that's how you differentiate it. So, uh, and a digital watermark is something completely you know, different. That, that's in the digital medium. So, alteration of a document, let's see. Uh, <clears throat> just talk about a case I was involved in years ago, and it, this, this was a pretty funny case because uh, these people got checks that were made out to Loco, which is our Long Island Lighting Company in uh, Long Island, New York, and they were for big money. This, this check was for 808000 and so these big companies were – sending in their, um, you know, uh, electric checks. Grumman, this is was from Grumman, <clears throat> which is a big company out here, so not bad, 808 grand. These people had somebody in the local office take the check and, you know, bring it to them. They eradicated the local, you know, lighting company uh, name on the check and made it out to this guy, John Lightson. Like, you or I try that and pass it in the bank, they'd lift you right out of the bank. But uh, these guys know how to do it the right way. So here's another check for 69000 And, again, made out to John Lightsey and this guy. And he would deposit it. The checks would clear because the money was there. Wilco, you know, doesn't tell these companies for like 30 days that they never got a check. So it's a pretty great scheme, and I have I should have another close-up of this as well. Um, the way they uh, they broke the case was w one of the checks, and it was this check got back to the company, and he said, John Lacey, and uh, it was a small company out in the, the north end of Long Island. He goes, I never wrote a check to John Lacey. Who the hell is that? And um, that broke the whole case open. If you look very, very carefully at that slide, what what they did was they took a um, an edge of a of a safety razor and just gradually picked away the toner that was on the check, and then retyped in that information. And if you saw the movie Catch Me If You Can with a big box of like inks and razor blades, that's exactly what they gave me with this case. Exactly. So it was, it was pretty wild. The guys got away with $1.4 million, and they blew it all in a week in uh, Atlantic City. There were five guys. It was an organized crime case. Five guys blew it in Atlantic City on cocaine and prostitutes and gambling. So, pretty wild case. All right, so now we're going to talk about um, a font substitution of a uh, document. Now, you have to recreate a document. This is exactly applicable to a case that I had. It's not the exact case, but it's bang on the money with the case that I had. And uh, here in the original contract, there are entries for uh, $700 in here in seven days from date of whatever. So <clears throat> just to kind of show you what happens with a photocopy, Uh, I'm having a problem on the computer, so I just got disconnected. Hopefully.
hopefully I can get back on. Oh, I'm back on again. Um, Brooke, are you there? We're here. Okay, can you, um, I just blanked down here, but can you see? Do you want me to take over and, and do the slides for you? No, yeah, let's see. I think I, um, I have it here. Can you see the slide that says date of signature and has original and fourth generation? Yes, we can. Okay, great. So, well said. Uh, sorry about that. And so the date of signature, if you just take a look, this is from the original document, and this is toner printed. And generally, it's like 600 DPI resolution for toner. Uh, it's pretty clear. And this is the fourth generation copy, which is a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy of the original. So there should be four copies in there, but a copy of that copy and then subsequent copies. And you can tell, like, the clarity is not as sharp and it's not as uh, defined. And sometimes when I deal with attorneys and I say, you know, I need the original, uh, I can't get the original, and, you know, it's too much effort on their part to get the original. And this is true with the DA's office, too. I mean, this is, I can't tell you how many times, you know, I encounter this. Until you show them exactly what the difference is and how it can help their case. Uh, sometimes the attorneys will tell you, well, I'll make a copy of what I have and I'll send you that copy. <coughs> and what I always suggest is, let me have your copy and, <coughs> and then you keep the subsequent photocopy for yourself. They're not too keen on that sometimes also. So here's a, a first generation copy. This is just strictly one copy from the original. Because if there's an alteration, generally you're not going to see that original in there. Uh, you'll always get like a copy of it. Um, and here are the two line entries, $700 versus seven days from date. The question is, were they done with the same font or different font? You know, and then if you think one way or the other, are you positive? Or are you just guessing? You know, what, what's the answer here? Let's see, I went back. So let's go to the next one. Did you go to the next slide? Because we're still on 54. Uh, actually, I'm on 56 now. Okay, yeah, something happened. So what I'm going to have to do is um, transfer it. Oh, no, wait, it transferred it back to me. Okay, give me one moment. For some reason, WebEx uh, kicked it back to me. So now... Can all of our participants hear me? If you can, uh, please just let us know in the chat feature. Thank you. Great. Thank you, guys. We're just trying to get our presenter back on. Looks like we have a little bit of a problem. We'll be right back. Thank you. Hello? Yes, you there? I got 
Great. We, we had a little problem there, but uh, we're back on, so we'll continue from 556. Okay, great. So okay, thanks. A, okay, so uh, here's a, excuse me, a font comparison of um, the, two, the two previous lines that we just looked at. So here, just for a uh, quick comparison, are the capital letter S, the R's, lowercase R's, and the capital D. And now, hopefully, you're looking at them and you say, you know what, I think there are some differences there. They're subtle. They're very subtle. So let's go to the next slide here. And this kind of points out those subtle differences, uh, differences in the serif on the S, the angle of the serifs on the S, the curvature that they call it the pump handle of the lowercase r. Very subtle. Let me put my arrows here. And here. And the inner aspect of the uh, uppercase uh, letter D formation. Very, very subtle. That's hard enough on a first generation copy. If you have like a fourth generation copy, forget it. <laughs> so that's why having uh, either the original or the copy closest to the original is so important on these kind of cases. On a signature case, maybe it's not so important. But on font cases or where you think there's a line substitution, they're critical. And hopefully you, you see why. So that, that's why I wanted to create that. I had a case that was exactly comparable with that, and hopefully the slide's going to load. And eventually, the uh, I'm sorry for my delay there. I was just, I hope this one came up. I'm incorporated to testify on it. They settle. I, I I can't believe the case settled, and the people I was testifying for were in the right. They were the landlords. And you know what? The woman said, and it had to do with a big piece of property. The woman said, you know what? I'd rather have a tenant in there, even though part of it was changed, than not have a tenant. And I was like, flabbergasted. I couldn't believe it, but, you know, that's how it goes. So, okay, let's move on to invented impressions. And uh, that little instrument right there, that stupid little box has solved more cases than, than you could ever imagine. And it's called an ESDA, and that stands for Electrostatic Detection Apparatus. It's made by a company called Foster and Freeman. And it was originally developed uh, to develop latent fingerprints on documents. And that turned out not to be uh, a good uh, way to do it, but they found that it was super, super sensitive for indented impressions. So if we take a pad of paper and label the sheet from the original sheet with a zero to one, two, and three, you know, third sheet down. We write an entry on that original sheet, and then we see if we can find it on the indented impressions from subsequent sheets down. Here's sheet number two. Visibly, you can see some type of, you know, image there. It may be hard, even this is with oblique lighting, to develop the whole thing, but maybe you can. I don't know. And the next sheet down, there are no indented impressions with oblique lighting or side lighting, same thing. So now let's process with the ESDA, and you see the, the full image coming up. And the next line should be a comparison. And there it is, side by side. Visibly, nothing was on that shirt, third sheet. Nothing. And boom, there's the uh, writing. And that's exactly how it works in a real case. So here's a real case, and um, pretty innocuous letter. You know, hello, long time no talk. This was left on a car. <clears throat> but the other letters you don't see were really, really, you know, graphic, sexual harassing this girl. So, uh, you know, I want to get all these. I want to process them for indented writing. And boom, here it is. It's directions to a party that the guy wrote on a previous sheet of paper. Visibly, there was nothing on this piece of paper to indicate any writing was on there. Nothing at all. So I had to redact the actual address, but he, this is out on Long Island, in, uh, not on Long Island, in uh, Bayside, Queens. And here was, the whole thing was directed.
directions for the party. This was right in this area was the actual uh, apartment number and address. This case, unfortunately, some slides got um, left out because, uh, for whatever reason, technical reasons. This was a double homicide where the guy chopped up two bodies. And I won't spend long talking on it because we don't have the other slides, but in here is it was the invisibly nothing there, and the invented impression was what one of the witnesses says where he talked about um, shooting the fat one on the couch and the other one with the 22, and that's exactly what was on the invented writing. Unfortunately, I didn't talk about that case. Oh, maybe it is on here. Uh, let me just see. Let me go to the next one. Yeah. We're missing the next one, but let me go back here. Uh, it, it was in this area right here. These other areas were, like, smudged down, but this was the area that had the information. And just to kind of uh, show you how I do uh, the casework, there's always a control in with the document. So I know the is is working accurately because this is a piece of paper from two sheets down where I write, you know, two sheets away and, you know, just my name and date. Then we do the exam. The prosecutor never discussed this in the opening uh, argument. He didn't have the information on the piece of paper until later. It was from a search warrant that nobody realized what was there, and so they couldn't use it in the trial. They convicted the guy anyway, but it was pretty neat. Uh, these are kind of out of order here, but this is a uh, altered driver's license. So um, this, well, let's just pass it. This was a driver's license that was altered, and they actually put the pigment on top of the um, those glass beads, the reflective beads. And, you know, it's just using the microscopy to, to kind of visualize. I'll, I'll go back to show you the pigment on there. But it's using, uh, you know, a microscopic analysis of the uh, paper or... <clears throat> whatever that document in quotes unquote really is. So just want to get to this one other slide. So what, what, yeah, this may have been should have been used beforehand. What is a question document? It could be a piece of paper, a wall, side of a box, you know, bathroom stall divider. Think of police departments and fire departments that have their internal squabbles and you'll see uh, all that kind of crap. I don't have time for those types of exams, but sometimes, you know, you get pressure to do them. Or you can have handwriting on hand. So uh, this is the hand. And this was a uh, body that was brought in. It was a suicide case. You know, I covered up where the head was. There wasn't any head. There was no head there and no legs, but... The, if you remember back to the infrared luminescence of the ink, there was writing on the hand that was very faint, and so infrared luminescence was used to uh, bring out the writing. Here's the writing on the hand. This was a scanned image of the hand just to show, you know, what was present. You could see something, but it wasn't very clear, and with the infrared you could see the, uh, with clarity what the writing was. Sometimes I'm asked to opine whether um, something is written in ball pen ink or whether it's a photocopy. It's like, you're kidding, right? Because <laughs> that's a pretty straightforward exam. Again, it's, it's using microscopy, but it's like, wow, you've got to be kidding. And sometimes, you know, court orders uh, are for the original documents to be presented. And especially in mortgage-type cases, when they submit photocopies, you know, for a forensic document or handwriting exam. I, I had one case where the, the R side one, just because it was a photocopy that was submitted, instead of the original. <coughs> it's actually pretty funny. So here's a uh, kind of a, uh, a view of what a photocopy uh, document would look like a toner document. So this is like a black and white printer, but toner. The, that toner is that plasticized material that takes heat to bind it to the paper. And if we just go back, this is ballpoint pen, so you generally you see pressure. You can actually see like a furrow. Sometimes you see striations that are present. 
<coughs> or non-inking areas that are normally found in, you know, when the ball travels through, through the ball housing. In microscopic examination, you'll see that the ink is really kind of adhering on to the paper fibers. <coughs> so we're actually coming close to the one hour, and my voice is just about gone. So here's four-color toner um, printing of a supposedly, you know, a ball pen ink signature. So the ink signature was scanned and then printed in four-color toner, and you'll actually see the color uh, <coughs> toner particles that are on there. But you need the uh, microscopic um, capabilities to see it and to see it clearly. And Jeff, uh, we, sorry to interrupt you. Um, you're still on slide eight. Oh, you're skipping up. Okay, we, we just had somebody question which, which slide you're on because they were seeing something different than you were. But we're on 82, right? Yep, we're on 82. Okay. Thanks. So uh, here's a side-by-side -side comparison of toner, which is that melted appearance. You can kind of see like melted beads here. And uh, four-color toner. Um, so they're melted beads as well, but they're tiny, tiny beads. And you really need uh, like uh, 100 power, 200 power to see those. <coughs> Uh, the slide on the left, this uh, photocopy toner, like 60 powers, enough to really differentiate that. And for the four-color toner, like I said, it's a much finer bead, and generally you need a compound microscope to uh, really make an accurate assessment on that. You really see the melted beads on there, and that's the best way to look at it. So uh, next slide. Um, same kind of deal where it has a very flat appearance to it, so uh, that's a big big help. Uh, felt tip writing, I'm, I'm going to go to the next slide. Felt tip writing, you'll see pen pressure as well sometimes, not always. But here's a comparison with felt tip. It's absorbed within the paper, sucked into that paper. And uh, inkjet ink, uh, which is four-color inkjet, and you'll see the different color uh, portions on there as well as black. So four color cyan, magenta, yellow, and the fourth color is black. Sometimes there are three color inks where they make black out of cyan, magenta, and yellow, but that's the older, much older varieties. So again, for me, it's pretty much of a straightforward exam, but you know, I have to be on site, I have to examine it, I have to bring my equipment there to examine it, but <clears throat> kind of funny. Uh, here's gel ink, and generally you'll see a, a deep furrow in the uh, in the gel ink line. You know, it's pretty much a, you know a kind of a, a light linking uh, light inking area in the center, and um, pretty distinctive. And it usually always, um, even with the lightest pen pressure, there's always distinctive pen pressure present. So, pretty characteristic look on it. Type font, if we don't, we, I'll cover this real quick. I get involved with these cases where you have to uh, satisfy uh, a law. In New York State, it's 12 point, and it's what's actually measured on the paper. It's a whole story of, you know, a printer saying, I gave you 12 point, but that's kind of like the family of size as opposed to the actual size measured on the paper. So uh, when you measure font, you go from the top of the A sender to the bottom of the D sender. There's a little bit of extra space in there, letting, and you get actually the 12 points. So here's this New York State Supreme Law that talks about 12 points, and it's um, to be printed was to be measured by the size of the character on the printed page, as opposed to that kind of family. We're almost done here. But it's complicated. It's not that straightforward because part of the New York uh, CLS CPLR um, law, which deals with contracts, talks about X height of uh, the size. And the X height is 45% of a specific point size. And, but they use this uh, size to be measured as decimal 351 millimeter. Well, this gets into old traditional point versus 
uh, and this the traditional point is 72.27 points per inch, as opposed to desktop publishing, which is 72 points per inch. So for 72, the traditional, it does come out to 351, but some laws are using the 72 points as opposed to traditional, which is 72.27, and everything's up in the air. It's crazy. But. So this I just testified a month ago. This is a typical chart I would use talking about what the size actually measures. versus the law states it has to be 12. And in these cases, I use both the 72.27 and the 72, and I have the scales side by side. On such a small distance, it doesn't matter. They're directly superimposable, less than, you know, a tenth of a hair width apart. You can't even tell the difference. <clears throat> Over 12 inches, you can tell the difference, but not within a half an inch, so... It's almost meaningless, but I use both on there just to show whichever the judge is inclined to believe. Because it's not really well defined there. So I, I guess now is a good time to stop for any questions. Brooke? Uh, okay. Uh, we just have one question. Um, they said this question is asked to you very respectfully with regards to forensic methodologies. You have described this afternoon, have you been prevented from utilizing any of these in court on the basis that they have not been shown to be scientifically reliable? No, I've never been, uh, I've never been prevented from talking about that. And uh, to respectfully answer that question, uh, that's their opinion, that it hasn't been shown to be scientifically uh, justified. Question document examination has passed Albert hearings and for New York State Pride hearings. So, of course, there's some controversy with Dalbert, some allowance, some have some issues with it, but generally there's no problem with acceptance. So. Okay, great. Um, we'll move along to the end of the presentation, and then we'll uh, wrap it up. Okay. So I'm going to let you go to the uh, – I, I, what slides are next here for the end? Uh, I can pass the uh, roll back to us, to pass us. Okay. <coughs> so we, we just answered our last question. Uh, here's Mr. Luber, the picture of him working hard. Um, we'll go to the end of our presentation. Once again, just a reminder that this webinar is eligible for CLE credit in New Jersey and is pending in Illinois, Minnesota, Missouri, and Texas. Uh, to ensure that you receive your CLE credit, please complete the survey at the end of the presentation, and feel free to email us at TASO, uh, you know, if you have any questions regarding the pending states of approval. The TASO group, of course, in addition to being your best source for testifying and consulting experts, we also offer our e-discovery and document management solutions, our free interactive webinars, and research reports on expert witnesses. We thank uh, Mr. Luber for his time today. And tomorrow morning, we will be sending out a link to a recording of this webinar, along with a link to the PowerPoint presentation. If you have any questions uh, regarding the presentation, please feel free to email Carol Kowaleski. Her email address is listed below. Or if you have any questions for Mr. Luber that weren't answered today, feel free to email Carol, and we'll definitely follow up with you. We thank everyone again for their time, especially you, Mr. Luber, and we look forward to seeing you in another webinar soon. Yep, you're welcome.